There are more fleets in Star Wars than you can shake a stick at. Ever in a conversation with a ship junkie and don't know what to say? Just add a number and the word fleet to it and you'll probably have a conversation topic. What do you think of the Empire's 7th Fleet, the New Republic's 5th Fleet, the 3rd Fleet? It goes on and on. Today, however, we'll be looking at a very unique type of fleet. I can already tell I'm going to say that word so much is going to drive me crazy. And that is fleets made up of one or at least only a couple types of ships. I've got five that I want to talk about today. That's not exhaustive, and if there are any one-ship fleets that I've missed, make sure you let me know down below. So I'm going to start off with probably the least remarkable entry on this list and the most common type of one-ship fleet we see in Star Wars. That is fleets which come from a single shipyard. So, in Star Wars Legends, after the death of Palpatine, the Empire broke up into a bunch of mini-empires. One of these was called the Pentastar Alignment. It was heavily isolationist, relatively hardcore in Imperial ethics, and had two military arms known as the Order and Enforcement Divisions. One thing common in Imperial Warlord factions is that they'll move away from standard Imperial fleet structure or that they'll swap out ships, and this was usually because of some limitation of resources, or because they developed something better. For example, Warlord Zinj developed the TIE Raptor, and he used them quite frequently in place of TIE Fighters. On the other hand, the Imperial Remnant which formed under Pelion used Prey birds instead of TIE Fighters because of material shortage. Going back to the Pentastar alignment, if we look at the Essential Guide to Warfare, it seems like their Pentastar alignment was pretty much just Enforcer class picket cruisers. Why, you might be wondering? Well, Jameis Shipyards, which made the Enforcer, was simply within their territory. This is probably the least interesting example because these ships would have been supplemented by other Imperial vessels, which they wouldn't have produced but would have had their hands on. Not dissimilar to, say, a Dusk on League Thrust ship, which was common but also accompanied by Imperial ships. On the other hand, a much more interesting fleet, in my opinion, is the Crimson Command. The Crimson Command was made up totally of red specialized victory class star destroyers it's unclear how many of these existed at the height of the crimson command but it was most likely several hundred many were unfortunately destroyed after the battle of endor and warlord infighting but the crimson command was actually created during the empire's height and was commanded by zinj himself the idea was that a large fleet of many victories would be a bit more flexible than a smaller fleet of more powerful imperial star destroyers the victory by the way is 900 meters and isd is 1600 so it's just over half its size i think it's not a bad idea but the victory star destroyer is not necessarily all that more flexible i still think a fleet of different ships would probably do a better job I also don't know about the red paint. Maybe it's got a psychological factor, but that paint's got to be expensive. I don't know. All right, next up, I want to talk about what is not only the most famous single ship fleet in Star Wars easily, I'd say, but one of the most famous and even mythological fleets in Star Wars history. I'm talking, of course, about the, guess it in the comments, the Katana fleet. The Katana fleet and Thrawn's hunt for it is the main focus of the second book in the Thrawn trilogy and plays a major role in how his campaign went as a whole. Here's what happened. At some point before the Clone Wars, and this lore is a bit weird, despite being largely demilitarized, the Republic decided that they would make a massive fleet known as the Katana fleet. You know what these things carried? A walker that I have known beef with, the ATPT. But I won't hold it against them, that probably probably wasn't their fault. Anyway, the Katana fleet was meant to show the wealth and the power of the Republic, but after it launched with its 200 dreadnoughts, a virus infected the crew, spread between ships, the captains slaved their ships together, and the Katana fleet jumped into God knows where. It was left unfound until the Thrawn campaign in 9 ABY when Grand Admiral Thrawn discovered the Katana fleet and made off with over three quarters of it. It never really saw action in its full might, and Thrawn certainly did not keep the Dreadnoughts together. Instead, he used them in a very reasonable way. Dreadnoughts would typically accompany Imperial Star Destroyers and would simply bolster the firepower of his fleets. That's actually one thing I really like about the writing of space battles in the Thrawn trilogy. After Dark Force Rising, which is book two when he discovers the fleet, every time afterwards that the Empire attacks, 
he's got at least several dreadnoughts with him. It gives him a lot more firepower and more flexibility. Thrawn was also smart to split the Katana fleet up because it allowed him to attack multiple targets at the same time. All right, the next thing I want to talk about is the Sith fleet from Knights of the Old Republic. So this is a sort of unique example. During the Jedi Civil War, the Jedi are beset upon by a unending legion of interdictor class cruisers. It's discovered throughout the story that this is actually because the Sith have secured a massive super weapon or at least mega structure known as the Starforge which is capable of producing almost an endless supply of vessels. Now, I don't know if this was ever made explicit, but it seems like the Sith really just chose one fighter type, one capital ship and had the Starforge pump out as many as possible. And I mean, if you've got an unending supply, that probably makes sense. My theory is that the Starforge may only be able to handle so many different types of instructions, printing instructions, or that it's simply more efficient to just pump out this one ship type. Admittedly, even the Republic at this time only has a couple of capital ships that got the blockade runner and the hammerhead. It may just be a technical issue, but either way, the lore stands. I'm kind of curious, what's your head cannon down below? Do you think it's sort of like a print where it's more efficient to just have one design that is continually pumped out or is it just a limitation all right finally from nearly the same era and in a somewhat similar manner we have the eternal fleet which was made up mostly of the same warship class hundreds or thousands of these ships in this case we actually have a good reason why these are all the same ships and that's because they operate together holistically despite being many individual vessels almost like a single entity and that's because of how they were controlled by droids i actually think it's really interesting and very different than what we see in star wars to have them operating in these big arrays it also makes them quite terrifying because it's very different than anything else we see it seems like a very dangerous very advanced enemy the eternal fleet also did have a flagship but to be fair that was built afterwards and the fleet is mostly made up as far as i know of that one capital ship class but yeah, that's pretty much all I have for today's video. While it is rare for fleets to be made up of one ship, like most of the fleets we talked about today, what's more common is to see meticulously planned fleets. A good example of that would be the New Republic's Fifth. All of the ships in that fleet were specifically designed. It seems like they had set numbers and ratios of different ship types. Then they continued to expand on, but I do consider that to be different. Anyway, I hope you enjoyed this video. Let me know what you'd like to see me cover next. Until next time, be safe, have a good one, and may the force be with you.